Katie, so welcome to the Token CEO Podcast. As I mentioned when you jumped on the Zoom, like you're my dream guest. I've been wanting you forever. There was some agent who's been writing us and I'm like, you can't get me Katie's hours. <laughs> I literally was like, and then I was very bitchy and I was like, I will not talk to you again unless she comes on the <laughs> podcast, which is so rude. But anyways, I've been following you. I've been following your career. I obviously watched you pretty closely with the 49ers because they stole our backup quarterback. But um, anyways, give us a little bit of a synopsis for anyone who listens to this about who you are, what you're doing why you love football, what your career's been like, like give us the 101. Yeah, so I, I mean, I grew up in a very, very small town. We had two stoplights in the whole town. Um, in the in middle Kansas, of Kansas, right? Yeah, yep. middle of Kansas. Um, very uh, Mennonite background for those who don't know me. Um, my grandpa was actually a Mennonite preacher. He was the um, president of a Mennonite college. I just love football, ended up getting into football later in life, played for eight years, played for Team USA, um, women's tackle football, and kind of got into coaching because my dad was a coach. Um, so, you know, went on to the NFL for five years. And right now my life is kind of turned to um, women's flag football. I have not ruled out staying in the NFL, um, but, you know, Lives change, mindsets change, priorities change with, uh, you know, any type of circumstance and yep. that's life. What what position were you? I played every position. I started out playing defense. I was a linebacker. I kind of came onto the scene late. I was, it was my victory lap in college, as I like to call it, my fifth year finishing up some credits. Yep, yep. And uh, I know a lot of people know how that goes. Yeah, we're, um, we're pro, we're pro five years of college. Yeah. Right? So I came in late to the season and didn't really have a spot on the team. And uh, one of our linebackers was going off to the military. And so I went up to my coach and I said, I want to play linebacker. And he kind of laughed at me and I said, no, I'm going to play linebacker. And so, you know, I loved, I started on the dark side of the ball, loved defense, played strong safety for team USA, played receiver um, and then ended my career playing quarterback. So you really have played it all. You're like the ultimate have, football yeah. player. <laughs> You're like, I'm special teams, Absolutely. I'm offense, I'm defense, I'm the QB, yeah. I'm also the coach. Um, okay, and then <laughs> I talk was, about... Yeah, I actually was the offensive coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's just like a woman, like just do it all. You're like, I'm going to have every position while I'm here. Um, and talk a little bit about what that journey was like, because I agree with you. I think that one of the things that happens to anyone in, in their career is everyone assumes you get to a point and you should be happy with that point. Like you've made it, you're, you know, you're where you wanted to be. For me, it was, I got a CMO job and everyone was like, well, that's it for you. Like you've made it to the top of the heap. And I was like, I fucking hate this job. This job sucks. I don't want to do this anymore. And it was head scratching to people. Same when I joined Barstool Sports of you know, people were basically like, you're an idiot. Um, but how do you, how have you thought about this journey? And, and what would your message to other people be in terms of like, hey, learn everything you can, try every position you're able to, uh, sit in every chair that's made available to you, you know, break the table, find new chairs. How do you think about that journey? You know, I, I think when we first initially, when we're young, we always think there's this goal that's going to make us happy. And um, once we reach that goal, we've made it. But I think it's human nature to always seek more, to always look for more. And your journey will never quite go as you expected. And I think the the path that's least expected is going to be your path. And that's what I'm finding. And, and I think as long as you live every day that you're not looking for the future to be happy, you're finding happiness in where you're at. That's what's going to be most important because you will never truly feel, feel feel fulfilled if you are just continuously looking for tomorrow or what's next or you know where how far can I get oh, I I completely agree with that I think that it's also great advice to be happy for you and fulfilled for for no one else but what's going to drive what's going to do it for you I think so often everybody gets all boxed in on who you should be or where you should work or what you should what you should be feeling or and I think just really I think one of the things that's so inspiring about you is 
it's almost as though you've broken through not to ju- not to break through but you're like hey I'm just doing what I want to do when I want to do it and I'm on my journey and you're finding fulfillment in that and I think people can take a lot of inspiration absolutely if you don't have a why that is internally motivated you will never truly find happiness if your why is constantly coming from external factors you know how people view me how much money I make that's not happiness happiness is what's going to fuel you from inside and that's going to to keep you going every day yeah that's awesome okay so let's talk about flag football my daughter plays flag football I have to say I love girls flag football like I spend every Saturday like freezing my ass off on a field watching like girls like very badly run around and try to grab the flags but it's an awesome sport and the girls are great at it like it's it's so funny because football has been so prohibitive and I think football is I think football simultaneously viewed as a coach's game where it's a strategy and then it's about size and speed and violent not violence but like physical contact and watching flag football you see how graceful it is how much it's about speed and maneuvering so tell me how you feel about flag football why are you excited about it what's the what's the space like for girls all that kind of stuff you know, I, I think flag football, we're going to see in the next few years, we're going to see a, a growth and um, probably something that a lot of people don't expect in terms of just how popular this sport is going to become. And I, and I want to make sure people don't think of flag football as like girls football and tackle football as men's football. This is a totally different, unique sport. And, it, you know, it's an avenue for women to actually now for the first year uh, go to college on a scholarship to play flag football. And, you know, I wish I had that opportunity when I was younger. So I'm, I'm seeing these, I'm, I'm working with Ottawa university where my twin sister is the head flag football coach. It's their inaugural season. Um, and just to see these young women now getting a scholarship to play football, to dedicate their time to school and football it's been uh, life changing for me personally. That's awesome. I think I wish I'd played flag football. Like I played field hockey. Field hockey kind of. What position would you have played? In flag football? Yeah. I would be the same in both. I'd be a midfielder. You know what I mean? <laughs> I would be like just running around in the middle. Um, but I do think you know. I think the thing that's cool about it is that it's, you know, I'm interested in women's hockey, right? Like I'm obsessed with women's hockey and. But hockey is a very cost prohibitive sport. It's you have to have ice time. If you're really serious about it, you got to have private coaching. You've got to have all the equipment. And the thing that's so great about flag is that you can play anywhere at any time. And it's it's really open. And I think that's what needs to happen more in sports. Like you look at flag football, ultimate frisbee you know, sports that anyone can pick up. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how small the town is you grew up in. So I think there's something really open about that, that I think hopefully will get more women to play. Like how many universities have programs? Do you know? So right now, I believe um, there are about 12 or 13 in the NAIA that uh, have a program and we're getting ready to play on Saturday, play Florida, um, and it's uh, going to be a pretty, pretty big matchup that we're pretty excited for. But I, I see within the next few years, I mean, I, I would imagine D1 schools will start picking it up as, you know, something that's just another sport in their program because of what you just said, that it's so cost efficient. I mean, you're getting more participation. Um, people are going to realize just how much women are actually interested in this sport. That's cool. Um, and then talk about a little bit your experience in the NFL. Like, it, give a sense of, you know, what is it like to be an NFL coach? Like, not just as a woman, but in general. Like, give a sense of, like, what, what, was, what did you love about that? What did you learn from it? What will you bring to flag football from it? I mean, I, I've grown so much as a person in terms of um, just how to relate to people, how to, how to manage expectations, how to deal with different types of people. Um, when I when I got into the NFL, I, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect from the players. I didn't know, I didn't really know anything at that point. You know, was, I was new to that culture. But what I found was that you know these are a bunch of professionals, and um, if you're there to coach them and you're you're 
um, true about just truly wanting to be there to make them better, they are going to treat you with the same respect regardless of your gender. And, uh, you know, my dad was a coach, like I said, I've always wanted to coach. And so leading people, helping people, that's always been my passion. And I've, you know, there's not a lot of a, a difference between NFL players and, you know, college female players. Mm-hmm. It, there's, there's so many similarities that, um, you know, I think I've taken so much from what I've learned in the NFL and help to hopefully grow this program that we're building in Ottawa. That's great. I, I also think that, you know, one of the interesting things about coaching, I, I think you said it right, actually. Sorry, let me dial that back. I think you said it right, which is, I think if you come into a job and a position and you actually just want to help people be their best and win, no matter what it is, who it is, what color they are, who they're sleeping with, what they did before, like if you really have good intentions and put the effort and the work in and can be consistent about making people better, then that's people will accept you no matter who you are. Not And I don't mean to say not where you came from, because you obviously, I think if you give good advice, people will assume you have credibility. But I think that it's really awesome to see you having reached such a, not a pinnacle, but you're, you're a groundbreaking person in the NFL, like no doubt about it. Like I watched your Microsoft commercial about 7 billion times. Like I'm like that, she's the female coach of the NFL. Like so, but it's also cool, I think, to bring something to – you know, I'm sure there's not a lot of money in women's flag football. Like you're not doing it for like a get quick, get rich quick scheme. Um, and I think that that's also like part of when you get to a, a big place and kind of making a pivot, it's like, how can you make something smaller feel just as big? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know a lot of people will say, are you going to be the first female head coach in the NFL? And, um, and, you know, now seeing this growth of women's flag football to me, being a head coach of the NFL, that that's not the highest level, in my opinion. Being a head coach, I know I'm going to be a head coach at some point in my career. That's what I've always planned on. But whether it's for a men's team, whether it's for a women's team, um, that's yet to be determined. But, you know, it's not that one is above the other. Even if you're looking at money, maybe, um, which hopefully will one day not be the case. But, you know, I would love to coach uh, women's you know, be a head coach of a women's professional flag football team, yeah. or, you know, look, you, I'm sure it'll be in the Olympics at some point. Um, and, and being there would be amazing. That'd be so cool, Katie. You should do that. That I think you're going to do that. <laughs> All right, let's mark it. Cause we will like come back to that. I feel like in the Olympics in like the next six years, that'll happen. That's cool. Um, talk a little bit about why is there a bias of men coaching women's teams is like, oh yeah, naturally they've got so-and-so as a head coach. Um, but women coaching men's teams is such an, ano- like an anomaly, it's like a freak show. Like, tell me, how do you see that being in the, in the business? Yeah, I think it's a social norm that needs to be um, erased. I think that we've grown up really thinking that, um, you know, we think it's odd to see a woman a woman leading men when in reality women have been leading people for years as teachers, as um, as parents, as you know. But now, you know, I was in Kansas City watching a ballet practice. Uh, I, don't ask me why. Um, but uh, <laughs> I realized I realized that they, you know, their director or if you in terms of football, their head coach was a man. And if stereotypically ballet is more of a feminine type mm-hmm. of activity. And I thought how weird it would be if I went up to him and said, do the women respect you as a man? Do they, you know, do they listen to you? And it just goes to show that gap that needs to be filled. And it really is just a matter of, you know, um, getting away from the social norms that uh, women are are supposed to be passive and and not assertive and 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 um, can't lead. They need to follow. Uh, so that's something that we just need to get away from. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also think that you are doing something really interesting. Like my observation 
I, I'm obsessed with Bill Belichick. Like, I think he's just the bomb. I, I would feel such pressure being an, an, an NFL head coach because I think it's just so cutthroat. Like, you, you see so many people try to ascend to be head coaches and then go back to it's, – it's clearly extremely stressful. It's clearly a pressure cooker. The stakes are incredibly high. But I also really like how you look at things, which is – you want to be a head coach, and you want to be a head coach in the best environment possible. Maybe that's the NFL. Maybe that's flag football. Maybe it's ballet. You know what I mean? And I think that's also something to give yourself the – for people to give themselves the permission to understand what they want but not be constrained by the place or the scale that it should happen in. Exactly. Yeah, when you open up opportunities for yourself – um, you'll see that so you'll find passion in so many more things that you've never even realized you had. Um, so Katie, we're also talking about how um, it, I think you seem very self-taught, which I could be wrong on that, but like the fact that you can be a quarterback, a linebacker, an O-line, D-line, the O coordinator, NFL, flag football. Like, so what's your process? Like how do you – how do you study to be great at things and what makes you great? So I remember back when I was playing youth basketball, I had a coach at the time that I didn't feel like was conditioning our team enough. I, you know, I was just kind of in that moment of just wanting to complain, you know, point fingers. And I was complaining to my dad, who was a coach at the time. And I was expecting him to just complain with me, you know, like, Go, go to, yeah, the, you're right. go to the code. Yeah, you're right. Like you, you need to do something. Like, but all he did was he looked at me and said, can you run on your own? If you're complaining about conditioning. And it was this sense of, you know, accountability. And you can't always expect that people are going to teach you everything that people that you're going to be led um, everywhere you want to go. And, and you can't just wait to um, have others clear the path for you. Sometimes you have to clear that path yourself. And for me, that was, you know, reading up on everything I could about football, because I knew that I was already going to be a step behind. I didn't have the college experience. I didn't, but I knew that I wanted to learn the game inside and out. And so it was, a I mean, I probably bought every book there is, um, read every book there is, started to, to look at different schemes, different coaching styles, and in a way, I think that helped me grow. So I it I wasn't just copying what other people have done and what I've seen. I created my own kind of philosophy, my own idea, um, and really started to look into why things happen the way they do. I think the other thing that I've read about you is that you have sought to make yourself irreplaceable. And that's a big theme for you. And I love that. I think that that is such a great way to encapsulate, like, it's not the same qualities in every person that make them irreplaceable. Every person can be irreplaceable. Not every person is irreplaceable. So talk about that. Yeah, I think when, regardless of what it is that you're doing, you have to find where you add value. Um, no one knows yourself better than you do. And when you can kind of evaluate the situation you're stepping into and say, where can I add value? Where can, where can I help this team grow where I know that my, my strengths can make this team better? That's where people will start to notice you. People will start to see that you truly are a, a key component to a successful team. And how do you, like, what makes you irreplaceable? Like, what are what are the things, what's your DNA in that? You know, I think a lot of it is work ethic. I mean, being available and, and being someone that says, regardless of what job it is, I'm never too high to get that job done. If I, if it's taking out the trash, I am going to be the best person at that job. If it's, you know, if it's calling plays, I'm going to be the best person. It doesn't matter if I'm CEO, if I'm, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I am making sure that at that moment, regardless of what it is, it's going to be the best job possible. And how do you deal with backlash or adversity and obstacles? Like you are clearly a woman who's like, I'm doing what I want to do. Like, how do you deal do you ever get down? Do you ever doubt yourself? Like, how do you deal with adversity? We all doubt ourselves. And I think we often 
look at other people and and we don't realize that we're, we're <clears throat> excuse me we're really only seeing their highlight reel and the more that we realize that we're looking at everyone else's highlight reel and we're hearing our own doubts but we have to recognize that everyone else has their doubts as well and those obstacles that you will come across the doors that slam in your face those are all a part of your path i've been turned down many times i've been um, you know, I, I wanted to be a volunteer coach for my college, but because I was gay, they said they didn't want me around the team. But that door that I felt slammed, that slammed in my face, that led me to football. I, I That's when I actually started playing women's tackle football. So without that, um, without that door closing, I might not be where I am today. And so yeah. every obstacle is just a foundation. And that's the, the attitude you have to look at everything that happens. Do you have like a list in your head? I'll hand up. I have a list in my head of like the people who, because you were gay, you can't do this because you were, you know, not smart enough. You couldn't do that. Like, do you keep a list? Yeah. Keep receipts for sure. Yeah, for sure. You got to keep the receipts. <laughs> like, I think every person inside of them has like a vindictive motherfucker. And they're like, you, you're you like, first of all, I wish everyone could see Katie. Maybe they will. Like your teeth are insane. Are they real? Well, actually, I don't have these two teeth. Yeah. See, I knew it. My twin sister, same thing. You we were both, both born without yeah, the and my teeth? grandpa, my grandpa, we got it from him. Really? <laughs> yeah. There's like a gene mutation. You're, you're, yes. <laughs> so do they pop out or are they in there no, permanently? No, they're, they're in. I can't do the, no. Oh, I wish okay. I could that do. That would be cool. When I was younger, before I, before I got the, I forget what you call them, but the implants. Yes, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, I would, you know have like the bugs bunny without oh know. yeah oh it was fun oh they're amazing they look great <laughs> i would be you. happy if i didn't have those if didn't, like born with the with the sours missing teeth gene. yeah oh we but anyways <laughs> that's awesome but um but back to the list is i think that that's like such a pivotal i, I think that's so insightful because i do think when things have you ever read the book the alchemist I do not think so. Okay, I'm going to send you this book. So my dad used to always give me, my dad was a teacher and uh, and my dad used to always, my dad was very big on this book called The Alchemist. And the whole like gist of The Alchemist is that the world will conspire to help you. And that if you're on the wrong path, you're going to meet a lot of obstacles. And it's an indication that like you're not on the right path. And I think sometimes when you face rejection for that's unfair or biased or or even because you're not good enough you're not right for whatever that thing is or not take back not good enough but you're not a fit for that thing that that's really the world helping steer you to something else and I think where often so many people get stuck is that you just stop there and then you you know hate yourself or you feel insecure or you blame everyone else and I think what's been so so awesome about your perspective is you're like yeah those idiots didn't hire me but like that opened a whole world that has made you who you are absolutely and I you know there's a way that we view the world and it's it our attitude dictates the narrative that we tell ourselves about our lives and if you have the attitude that you know man, I just, I just keep getting turned down. I'm a failure. Then that's going to be your narrative and you have the ability to write your story. And for me, you know, we all are going to hear, no, we all are going to have doors slam in our face, but what's your narrative? What, what's the story you're telling? I mean, I just want Katie Sowers on here every week. All right. Can <laughs> you said something that I want to come back to, which is what are the, so, so sorry, I have two things and then I'll let you go. Um, how do you motivate a player that does not want to be motivated, whether it's a college woman in Ottawa who's playing flag football or you've got, a, you know, a linebacker or whatever? Like, how do you motivate a seemingly unmotivatable player? I think the most important thing is you have to figure out what's motivating them. And if, if a player is not wanting to be motivated, what's their why? What, why are they there? And when you can sometimes dig deep into what's that internal why, um, you can oftentimes help find that player's internal motivation. I think a lot of times when a player is not motivated, it it's a lot of things that we don't see on the surface. 
And it typically goes deeper, whether it's they doubt themselves, maybe they're afraid of failure. Um, you know, maybe maybe they just have been forced to, to be in that position and they really don't love it. Like they, you know, so you can't force a player to find internal motivation, but you can help them find their why. And if mm-hmm. you help them find their why, you'll you'll see that motivation comes and success will follow. And how do you think about, would you prefer as a coach to have, like, I, I just thinking back to my college teams, like, and I think it's true of every team, you have the supremely gifted, lazy, nails it, but is a horrible practice player, like, they're just, like, great at the games. And then you have the, like, show up, work so hard, listen to your coaches. Like, which do you prefer, and do you think you need both? I think you need a little bit of both, but I definitely prefer – the player that's going to go out there and be a good teammate that's going to be able to learn every single position because they study every single position because they know that um, nothing's too small for their role, that they are willing to be there. They are happy to be there. Um, they know that, that that's where they're meant to be. I would take that player over a player who's been uh, gifted with athleticism, but hates what they do and and they're just there for themselves. Yep. Okay. I agree with that. And then finally, Katie, give me the archetypes of types of coaches. And then my, then my second question is, which one are you? There, you know, there's a lot of coaches that are more X's and O's. There's a lot of coaches that are more motivational, like teachers tell stories. Um, There are more there are a lot of coaches that are very uh, player oriented, uh, you know, individual oriented. I would say I'm a mixture. Uh, I love to find motivation in um, in ways that keep players' attention, whether it be you know showing videos, whether it be um, you know helping them realize that they're in a moment that they're one day going to miss. Because I think if they can realize where they're at and what that they're living in a memory down the road that they are going to wish they had back. And the more they can realize that the better off they're going to be. And so that's, I, I, I'm a coach that tries to inspire to be not only better on the field, but better off the field or down the road when they're looking back and they say, I did everything I could to make that moment the best. All right, Katie, you're the best. Thanks for doing this. I can't wait to root for you coaching in the Olympics for America's flag football team. So that's (laughs) going to be my goal. Um, Congratulations on everything, and we can't wait to follow everything that you do. Thank you. Yeah, you're going to see a Sours duo in the Olympics. Let's go. (laughs) That's going to be – that's really going to be a head spin. Like, not only are there two – women, are you identical or not? We're we're identical. Oh, let's go. Okay, (laughs) so – but they're going to be like, what's the, what are it's the Americans so bringing? It's so confusing. Yeah, absolutely. For everybody. Yep. That's amazing. All right. Well, good, good luck. Thanks for doing this. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. Bye, Katie. Bye.